Thank you all. That was uh, diverse and interesting uh, perspectives from all of you. So uh, before we get to the audience questions, I want to pick on three things that each of you, one from each that uh, you all said, and ask for some reaction or some additional thoughts. Uh, Bill, the thing that, uh, one of the many things that was interesting in your presentation is your description of this relationship between staff and and counselors, uh, sort of in the previous era. And I, as a former city hall reporter, I remember when uh, the city reports come out, the staff reports on a particular topic, we would, and I think I probably took, to a fault, took them as gospel. They were, they were these sort of unimpeachable, independent, expert uh, recommendations based on research and evidence and all that kind of stuff. And I find now I am prof just profoundly skeptical of the quality of evidence, the quality of advice that's coming from city staff, from planners, from finance, um, from all of it. And so I wonder, when it comes to accountability, from all of you, what is the role of that kind of independent expert advice and whether it's able to be fully debated publicly um, and, and whether counselors and counselors in this case actually listen to it and take it. So what's what's the what's your view on that? Maybe start with Muriel. Um, without uh, staff and outside expertise as well, uh, you're lost in government because there's no way you as an individual can research uh, the issue at hand. Uh, for me, I think it's the uh, the way you approach an issue. I, I know what stood us in good stead in terms of uh, membership in cabinet. And again, I, uh, uh, I realize it was time specific, but it was that our, our uh, issues were presented to us in terms of uh, the problem, the history of the issue, the, pro the options, the pros and cons, uh, the recommendation and uh, the implications. So it, it was a problem solving approach uh, that we had. Now, within that, um, if people felt there wasn't sufficient evidence, you could n uh, not approve the, the motion and uh, as refer it back for more background. Uh, in consulting expertise, though, we found often that uh, they were wanting to do a, a narrow, deep study that would take some time, whereas we were having to make decisions on complex issues rather quickly. So. Uh, uh, the role of the decision maker, the political decision maker, is substantially different than that of the, uh, the research academic. Royce, over to you. Um, with, with respect to accountability, uh, <coughs> members of the civil service are not uh, accountable in the way that we're talking about tonight. They're kind of accountable in a managerial framework if they are incompetent. Uh, minister, the mayor should not be blamed for that. Uh, what the mayor was blamed for was the way he, he handled this. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. The way he uh, he handled the situation. So um, I'm not sure about accountability. The fancy word for uh, or the fancy phrase is policy capacity. Uh, does a government have the capacity to uh, to uh, uh, do the things that it needs to do in terms of public policy? Can it get good advice? Can it get specialized? Uh, advice that you can count on, uh, and I think that probably most people would say in the city of Winnipeg, uh, the answer is is not not always. Uh, then a lot of city departments, uh, Winnipeg is somewhat lacking in policy capacity and the extent to which elected officials can actually get uh, good advice uh, uh, prior to making decisions uh, on some of these local issues. Yeah. Bill, can I pick up on a different aspect of your question? Uh, when when I was elected to council. I was one of three who elected the same day in by-elections under the auspices of the ICEC. I can't speak for the other two, uh, one now dead, but I think I, I, I know where we all were. Uh, I think our view was that if we were going to be effective, and indeed if the council was going to be effective, you had to have people on it who identified with one another and were prepared to make collective decisions and take collective responsibility. And uh, I think in its limited way, the ICEC did that. Um, after I'd been there for a year or two, I tried to encourage the notion that the ICEC caucus, which was always hovering around you know, 
were close to a majority, or maybe just a fair majority. But there were a number of others who were elected as independents. And there was, of course, an NDP caucus in its own right. Uh, and I raised the question of trying to make some approach to the independents outside the ICC caucus. Um, and a point uh, came where most of them at the ICEC would meet before council meetings over dinner. Uh, it wasn't a cabal. I mean, there's not a great deal you can do over dinner that is going to affect the, the way a council meeting uh, proceeds. But I think what we were trying to do was to understand where everybody else was on, on the issues that we were going to be dealing with in the agenda and to see if we could find commonalities that would allow us to deal with some of them in a particular way rather than you know, with, with sort of artificial opposition and so on. Um, it worked for a while, but I think the, the problem ultimately was that the, the people, the independents outside the ICEC um, found it difficult to uh, sort of buy into that, and I guess for the very good reason that they weren't sure they could be re-elected in their wards, you know, with an ICEC connection. So, I mean, they wanted to retain the labels of independence, but they wanted also, uh, you know, they were sympathetic to the idea that we worked together. And I think in the end it fell between two stools. And uh, truth to tell, I was one of the first to leave. I mean, I, I got to a point where I was so frustrated by these pre-council meetings and by the kinds of understandings that we entered into with one another, which fell flat the moment we were, you know, we were on the floor. Uh, I, I got to the point where I thought I could actually, on some issues, make, make greater headway on my own. I mean, I would go to other councillors on an individual basis, knowing where they stood, knowing where I stood. You know, can we deal with this? Can, can we get that through? And it's, it's a very difficult thing, I think, because um, the perks that are perhaps associated with a cabinet at the provincial level and federal level are not available at, at City Hall. Um, and it, um, it, it really does, at times, come down to sort of trying to herd chickens. And uh, anyone who's tried that, I think, knows it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I also wanted to pick up on something that uh, Muriel uh, just sort of made passing reference to, this, this new notion of um, uh, you know, a conflict of interest commissioner at City Hall, an ethics commissioner, a lobby commissioner, all of these typically provincial and federal um, accountability bodies now being applied to City Hall. Toronto has them, for example. Um, and I've often wondered whether we put too much faith in those watchdog bodies, auditors general, for example, um, and, and we don't do what Howard Pauly suggested, which is make sure you're everyday internal processes are accountable and open and fair and, and reasonable. So I'm wondering what your views are, all three of you, on this notion of external watchdogs at City Hall. Is that a, a sort of a knee-jerk reaction to this latest scandal, or is it something we really need? Let me start with you, Royce, if you're ready. Half-baked half kind of response. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't, uh, I, I don't particularly like the idea of, of external accountability in this kind of crop of actors that are not necessarily political in nature, they've shown up at the federal level uh, to provide accountability. Accountability is a political thing, uh, and opposition is a political thing, and should be carried out by politicians. They're the ones that are best uh, equipped to do it, because uh, as I talked about in my presentation, it's, uh, uh, they're the ones creating self-interest as the way to ensure the best kind of accountability from politicians. Now, the fact that we don't see that at the local level might mean that you have to turn to these, uh, these external actors. Uh, but in general, I'm, I'm, gen I'm skeptical about uh, the extent to which external actors in politics can create real accountability through opposition. Bill? I, I, in my time, I've come almost full circle in, on this question. When I, after I'd been on council for a, a short time, I, um, well, as I mentioned, I, I made overtures or prompted the ICEC to make overtures to um, other independents on the council with a view to working together at least on some issues. But when I look back at it now, it seems to me, uh, and I was, and I should say, I was along with that a critic in some respect of the Board of Commissioners. I mean, I, I re recognized their ability, but I also recognized their power, uh, which lay in, to some degree, not in controlling the agenda, but in writing the material that, that was given to us in support of it. 
Um, over time, I began to, to feel differently about that. It seemed to me that it was necessary that somewhere in the system there would be information generated that, upon which we could make uh, important decisions. And I'm sorry to say that I gradually came to the view that it was not going to be in our caucus or indeed in any other caucus. Um, and partly because unlike the caucuses at the federal and provincial level, we had no means of uh, enforcing cohesion, you know, of getting commitments and then proceeding with, with a, a plan. Uh, you, you could get agreement, but between dinner in one building and convening a council in, in the next, you know, the, some of them, some of them had become waifs and strays. You know, and you just couldn't be sure at that point whether they were even present at the at the meeting, let alone prepared to to act collectively on. So I'm I'm rather agnostic now, I guess, as to what would work best. Yes. Well, my perspective on it is, uh, in in a sense, almost looking at the pros and cons of having political uh, or a partisan organization. Uh, the con, of course, is that you maybe do not have structures that engage you in consensus building. And uh, since many people don't tend to think about underlying values and assumptions of how the world works, which is really, in my view, the, the basis of a political party, which I think forms, if you start with a, a, a group that uh, of, of mixed background, that there's a tendency to form into clusters of people who hold similar values and goals, if you like, and have similar assumptions about how, how the world works. Uh, so that uh, I, I think to be more overt about that and to run, uh, it, when you run on the basis of belonging to a political party, in a sense your accountability is wrapped up in those values and assumptions about how the world works. Whereas if you uh, run uh, to be one, one of, a, of a council, uh, you run into the problems that Bill has uh, identified, that th it, there aren't incentives uh, to be more outspoken and, uh, and active. Uh, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's a weakness I hadn't thought about. Uh, people cite the Nunavut government, is it, that operates on a conciliar basis, and uh, uh, discussion goes on with equal respect, I presume, for all members long into the night, I'm told. Um, so it's, it's uh, good in terms of the participation, but I'm also told that very few decisions get made, so there's not much action, and if you are uh, act an active, but want to be in a more activist government, that would be a very uh, difficult thing. I still think we should optimize opportunities, though, within the provincial government for uh, consensus building activity so that uh, every committee meeting or uh, every issue would not be dealt with on a, uh, a sharply divided partisan basis, but there'd be more opportunity for finding the similarities, uh, recognizing there's still going to be uh, a separation. Uh, there's going to be some divisiveness. So that's sort of an ambiguous answer. It, uh, I, I know I, I argued that uh, parties at the local level held accountability. Bill pointed out it's kind of a, it's a tough thing to do sometimes. You don't have the carrots. And, uh, the, the party leader at the federal and provincial level, they have lots of carrots to give to their MPs in order to keep them disciplined. I interviewed Sam Sullivan, the former mayor of Vancouver, uh, who actually is a party leader. He was the mayor and the leader of the nonpartisan association. I talked to him about party discipline. He said, well, I, I got into office and he, first of all, he lost votes. He couldn't discipline his caucus. They voted against him. Uh, so he figured out the way to deal with this is they would have a caucus meeting before council. And he'd say, all right, we're going to be uh, voting on this issue. What do people think? Uh, they'd take a vote. And whatever the majority opinion was, he said, oh, that, well, that's my position too. Uh, and so this was the way that he, uh, he enforced discipline in his uh, municipal party. And he did this so effectively that the, uh, the newspapers started talking about his ironclad discipline, uh, how he was pounding down opposition. So I thought that illustrates beautifully how uh, parties might not work the way that uh, we expect at the local level. So that actually answered my last question, which, which was why don't we have party discipline um, in, at City Hall? And I think that's a pretty cogent uh, explanation of why that kind of 
why the parties don't uh, infiltrate uh, City Hall. So, so what I might do then is open it up to questions. Just before you, here, go, please. I mean, there's an exception. I don't know really, that Muriel wants to speak to this, but I don't know the situation. I don't think it holds now. But there was a time when there was a relatively cohesive NDP caucus on the City Council. Um, interestingly, I mean, they never elected anything like the number of uh, councillors that one might have anticipated looking at their success, you know, in North Winnipeg and South Central Winnipeg. Uh, I mean, there, there was no transference of party support from the provincial level to NDP council or candidates for council in those areas. But in my time, at least, that's as close as we came. Well, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, I don't think I'm breaking any secrets here, but that issue came up when I was president of the party. And one of the so-called NDP members of the, uh, of the municipal caucus uh, broke ranks. I can't remember what the issue was. And the party wanted to discipline him, or one other member of the city caucus wanted to discipline him. You know who our biggest opponent to proceeding with that? was the Premier, and he thought that having the same party at both levels would be unhealthy. And I was thinking philosophically, don't we want to move in a certain direction and share goals? So I was flummoxed by his view, uh, but he held it for uh, reasons that uh, were uh, meaningful to him. As, as a footnote, I have to say that some of the NDP councillors who were there when I was there were the most right-wing people I've ever encountered. <laughs> Who wants to take that? I've got one simple answer. At-large system. Mm -hmm. Vancouver. Uh, I imagine most people are not in favor of that, but uh, when you talk to councillors that like the at-large systems in, in British Columbia cities, they give exactly that reason. They say, we're not here representing particularistic uh, interests from certain neighbourhoods. We're here constantly thinking about the city as a whole, so that's one way to get at it. Uh, opponents of at-large systems argue, I think pretty persuasively, that. Uh, Councillors in these cities do not take the interests of the city as a whole into account because they tend to come from the, the, the well-off parts of the city. Uh, it's certainly true in Vancouver. Uh, and you can imagine that happening here as well. But there's an easy cure-all answer to your question. So how do we do it without legislating? Uh, introducing... Oh. I, I mean, how is it possible to I, I already gave you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> The professor what, what about Dennis Lewicki's uh, op-ed article today, where he talked about the need for vision and leadership? I mean, that can build uh, more cohesion, but I, I don't know, without having political parties which have a platform for the whole of the city, we would have a platform from the whole of the city, uh, I don't know how you overcome that with councillors just representing their particular right. It's an interesting question. What would be the role of the mayor in that? I mean, the mayor is supposed to be the one that has the vision for the city and musters council. Is there any, we've lacked that in the last two years, but is there any role for the mayor to act as that? Is that person? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, any thoughts? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I think ultimately the, the problem we're dealing with are the councillors at large. And, um, most councils would not want, I think, to run on a, on a platform or a, a, in a party you know, that was led by a mayoralty candidate. I mean, they would feel that they, if so facto, they lose their independence if they got elected. I, I just don't know how to square that circle. Well, everything seems to be more cut and dried in uh, 
as, <coughs> at the civic level when the mayor and the EPC presented it. Again, I'm, I'm not as experienced in, at the city level, so I don't know if that's true, but I don't see when, when and where is the opportunity for input from the uh, entire council or the citizenry. I, uh, I was associated with, so I haven't actually been uh, uh, present uh, with groups that do go and make regular presentations, the Council of Women of Winnipeg being one, and uh, uh, I don't think they feel that the points at the time at which they're able to make presentations that, it, it, that there's any time between the input and the decision making. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't know of any uh, mechanism that would, uh, I mean, unless it could be redesigned. It's a, it's a great it's a great idea. It's an easy fix too. I I, I would imagine that most of these council committee meetings are open for the most part, but uh, those that aren't, they should be. One one of the big things uh, is that a lot of stuff that happens on the municipal level that's actually open to uh, engagement. It's not advertised. You, it's, it's actually kind of hard to know what's actually happening. I have to dig into the uh, city website like 10, 15 links later. Oh, fine, there's the community council meeting. Uh, so if they could open that up a bit better, that would enhance that even, even more so. There, <clears throat> excuse me. There is something that did happen while I was there that uh, you reminded me of, Roland. Uh, early on in my time on council, the issue of rail relocation was raised. And I was too new and dumb to, not to realize that I was going to step on toes in doing this, but I moved that we should go in have public hearings in the areas that would be most affected, because that was the argument. You know, that although there's lots of economic reasons, perhaps for rail relocation, it's going to have an enormous impact on on the adjacent populations. So we had two days of hearings in a gym in whichever school it was nearby. After I've forgotten how which it was. Um, the effect of it really killed rail relocation. I mean, I think the, the opposition from those who were going to be most affected by it um, was so overwhelmingly negative uh, that it persuaded a majority of us that we, we simply could not proceed. Whether it was the right decision, uh, I'm, well, I'm not, I, I think it was the right decision, but I mean, there, you could make the argument that, uh, I mean, some of, some of my colleagues at the time thought this would rule by the mob, um, which it certainly was not. But, I mean, th there is that problem, you know, whether you base policy on, on the last crowded meeting that you've attended uh, and what seems to be the consensus of, of those people who happen to show up for it. But I don't know, I, can't, I, I don't think while I was on council we ever used that mechanism again, and I'm not aware that we've done it since. But I would think that from time to time there are probably issues of broad sweeping significance where that kind of mechanism could be used and maybe more widely in a variety of communities uh, where councillors in a particular area convene in such a meeting over a day or two. You know, it'd have to be something substantial and have to be important and have to be consequential. Um, but as I say, I, I found it one of the most interesting and helpful things that I participated in while I was there. The only thing I can suggest is uh, this prior consultation idea when you're going to relocate the, the CPR yards. Uh, it takes money, of course, but uh, to go out and have a series of, of presentations where uh, they have a broader rationale and perhaps a less explosive environment could be held. Uh, but then the presenters would have to be genuinely open to what was being heard, uh, but they would uh, they would have the opportunity to try and sell the idea. Uh, there's no easy way, though, on contentious issues. But can you ask more about environmental groups and yes, I'm poverty about, groups? Yes, yeah. that would be so society kinds of organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to me, they don't look like they play that much of a role, uh, although they seem to. 
private little counselors and the mayor accountable at some times. And I'm just wondering, wondering about how the panelists see it and how it might be enhanced. It's a, it's a sporadic thing. Um, every once in a while, there's a confluence of factors, a certain issue and a certain degree of public opinion and a certain group is in the right place at the right time and all of a sudden a uh, group can be your enormously effective accountability actor and that's a wonderful thing uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis um, you know, you, I think you want more than that kind of thing but no you're right civil society groups have, have been fantastic accountability actors uh, at, at all three levels of government at, at, uh, at different times. Doesn't there also have to be uh, administrative staff who are receptive to the ideas? Like we lost all our environmental people in, in the current regime, and uh, much is, is going on at the federal level. And uh, uh, so, the, any advice that is coming from the staff uh, would not it would not even uh, point out the pros and cons, even if they recommended against it. So it's, it's a complex issue. And of course, all the uh, building up the environmental committee again and maybe having the advisory committees, it's, it's costly. So the old question of are we always going to be, as politicians, I think collectively we uh, are partly responsible for having uh, conditioned the public into thinking what's in my pocket, what's in it for me, is what elections are all about and not presenting a vision of, of the broader whole and the deeper issues. It's a major challenge. I want to play hockey at age 87 or something. <laughs> I better, but I don't know anymore. <laughs> Is there any value to having the mayor who sticks around that long gets reelected that many times? <laughs> institutional memory. <laughs> I think she's she's found how to take how to uh, uh, pipe into the dominant opinion of the area. Yeah, I don't know if dissenting groups would be very happy with her. Has anybody studied Mississauga? Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Uh, in terms of kind of intensive study, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know why. I don't get. I don't get her appeal personally. I don't know what. It, I don't understand. I'm sorry about that. I wish I knew. I wish I understood. What about Ford? I, I kind of. I understand Ford a bit better. <laughs> complications in terms of their professional or other uh, business activities. Um, there are privacy issues, I, I think, that, that, that go with it. Um, and there are opportunity costs, I, I suppose, that uh, you know, in terms of what you do normally, advancement and promotion or expansion may be limited by the fact that you have an ongoing public commitment. Um, those just off the top of my head, and I suppose there would be there would be other considerations as well. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> in, in my time, and I'm sure this is probably true of every one in this room. I've met people who wanted to go into politics, and I can even think of one or two who did, who were on council while I was there. And so help me God, I wish they had felt otherwise about it. <laughs> um, you know, they were. They were in some ways menaces. I mean, they, they had agendas that were so personal and idiosyncratic uh, that, and I, I'm 
very tempted to mention names, please, but I don't want no, no, but I, but I, <laughs> I don't want a lawsuit, even though there are several lawyers here to whom I can turn. But um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example without identifying the, the counselor. Uh, I was fortunate enough when Bill, Bill Norrie was concerned to, uh, who was mayor, to go on a trip to China when we entered into a twinning relationship with the city of Chengdu. A year later, uh, or thereabouts, the mayor and their party from Chengdu came to Winnipeg to return the favor, as it were. They had the misfortune to be here when Tiananmen Square and all that stuff arose. And I mean, it was hard not to feel compassion for them. I mean, the, none of them spoke English. The way that they all spoke to us through through interpreters, so it, was, I mean, it would be hard, I think, to know what they were feeling anyway, because they weren't going to share that. But at a council meeting that was taking place during one of the, while this was going on, one of the then councillors tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you second this motion? And the motion was to direct the Chinese delegation to pack their bags and get out of the hearing. Now, you know, I, I was stunned at, at the, uh, well, the words fail. I mean, it was so insensitive, mean, cruel, and all, all those things aside, it was impolitic. Uh, but I mean, in, just in terms of the human dimensions of it, to ask the delegation, cut off from information when their homeland is in turmoil, to go home, you know, because we wanted to express some moral position on what was going on. Well, to say, you, you only need one of those on a council, uh, and one is often more than enough. It's a, it's a good question to ask about uh, uh, school boards, too. Um, I'm spending more and more time on the school board elections. Um, and uh, I, I, I want to be nice, too. Sometimes I, I kind of wish there were higher quality candidates running for school boards. Um, I, that didn't sound nice at all, actually. <laughs> no, not successful. Okay. Um, uh, and, and one of the problems with the school board elections, that a lot of this is a pet peeve of mine, is that people look at school boards as a, a launching pad into higher political office, and it's a real pet peeve of mine. Instead of people who have an interest in the administration of schools, you get people that <laughs> went to two school board meetings before, and it's, what well, candidate was bragging about this? Oh, I went to two meetings before I decided to run. Uh, and, and so that's uh, actually, school boards are actually a location where this is, a, I think, a, a, a real issue, really good. Uh, no, I, I won't say that, but I would like to see more people run. Democracy is not simple. <laughs> and with everyone having a voice, uh, and if there are vacuums, uh, people, the, the others, other people are there. So to me, though, I have a personal peeve. I feel that in the 70s, we had sort of pointed out some of the problems of transnational corporations and the effect on people. But somehow now, 30 years later, uh, 40 years later, uh, politicians are looked at as crooked, uh, uh, self-seeking, egotistic. As a woman politician, we were excluded from running until really the breakthrough in the 80s. So we had a little, you know, it was not that good people didn't want to run, it's that the uh, public had not yet moved to where they would accept us. So uh, it's a complicated issue. We've got time for a couple more. Uh, uh, Bill touched on one of the questions I wanted to ask. We need a D.I. McDonald as the Chief Commissioner of the City of Winnipeg right now. He's one of the great, I think, public servants, if not the greatest public servant you probably had. And I think he was probably very much instrumental in creating your with the provincial government creating the commissioner system. I think that's central to the failure of the city of Winnipeg, is a failure to have a quality civil service providing advice to part-time uh, uh, counselors as well as full-time counselors. I don't know, I read the paper every day. I, I don't know, though, if Mr. Buddha, I understand, is a hard-working guy, but outside of him, I really don't know Who's advising who in the city? I don't think they've got the quality. We had a debacle with, uh, with the assessment department for years between the province and the city. They didn't have a competent assessment department. And right now, 
They don't have, and I can probably be sued for this bill, they don't, well, when the city of Winnipeg has an assessment problem, they settle. They don't want to go to the public utility anymore. It's too complicated and it's too embarrassing. So fundamentally, they have to resurrect, in my view, they got a commissioner system where you have quality people. Then you've got to attract quality people. I don't think you can attract quality people unless you're paying a decent salary. So I may, with respect, will disagree with you in terms of things. But I sat on the committee for Mr. Rory, where we recommended a very high increase in salary and also a pension. I don't think they provide pensions now. So I don't know if somebody who wants to run for council to make it a career really will enter, for, besides the pressures you have, you've indicated, uh, is the fact that there isn't enough security or enough ability to make a decent living. So we really have a lack of Joe Zubin sitting on council today or people like Joe Zubin. That becomes a problem. And I think people look at city council as a second rate. They think politicians are bad, and particularly uh, school boards and city councils. So I think a lot of people aren't interested, in, and that's part of the problem. I don't know how you solve it. Perhaps you people can tell us. Well, I, I agree with almost everything you said. But I'm not sure that there's anything. I have that in writing. D.I. <laughs> yeah. um, McDonald had retired by the time I, I got to council, but I, I came to know him slightly sort of off duty. But I, I, and I think he was a, a singular person. But I would also make the case that, the, that even after he retired, the Board of Commissioners overall <coughs> allowed the city to function better that it would have functioned without it. Uh, I mean, I think Nick Dacu uh, you know, was, is a very fine person, honest, able, smart, and, and with a good political sense you know, as to what would fly and what would not. Um, and I was, you know, without dotting every I and crossing every T, I think that's what I was really saying in my opening remarks, that the loss of the whole system with the Board of Commissioners uh, I think gives rise to the kinds of problems that we have been facing with the current system. Or else they could come and take political science courses at the U of M. That's <laughs> <laughs> too late. Oh. I, I'd just like to uh, differ a little with the best and the brightest side of it because. Uh, For that particular purpose. I mean, they have to have yeah. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say in building an inclusionary society, you never quite know who is going to emerge as the as the valuable voice. So, uh, I, but I do agree with the general thing. Unless we make it real at an earlier age and throughout life, uh, where is democracy really learned and practiced? And you have to learn yeah. it's an education. You just don't fly, you know, it's not a fly by night kind of. Thing, and that's mm -hmm. how I feel our government operates now. And then when you get this, you know, you have a crisis, you don't know, seem to know what to do, but you should know what to do because you've been trained to do it. I, I'm guessing, I, and this is only a guess, that. Um, it will be a while before all the relevant documentation relating to the, that particular matter goes into the files, and probably a while longer before that, that it will become accessible. I mean, I, I'm sure there are archives, city archives now, for covering periods in the recent past that will be accessible in, in time, but, but aren't now. You know, they may involve people who are still alive, they may involve issues of confidentiality and those kinds of things. Um, but I think the, con the, the controversy over the, the uh, refurbishment of the post office and the, uh, and the relocation of this uh, fire station, uh, I suspect that, that there are probably people down there who would like to burn the files. Uh, because I can't imagine that when the time comes to go through them, that it's going to reflect well on those who were involved in the decision. I mean, I, I, I've got several lawyers here. I hope I'm not saying anything that may 
You are. <laughs> throw me in jail. You are. You are. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, in that case, I may as well vote for broke. Um, no, I mean, I, 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 I don't think we'll know all of that story for some time. That would be my guess. So can't hold the whole council responsible? It's well, I, that's a different matter. I mean, you can't control how people will vote, and uh, they may smell a rat. Uh, or, or sense that something's wrong without being able to document it, document it and then vote accordingly. And indeed, that they are perfectly entitled to. Going forward, couldn't you try to build a culture uh, within the council, especially at the, at the mayoralty and senior level, of sharing information or making it accessible to the members of the council, like thinking that they all uh, have a responsibility to keep up to date on the good news and the bad news so that, in a sense, you're not, uh, there can be more accountability. I don't know how the members of council who don't have access to this information, I don't know how they can even feel accountable for, for errors or, or gaps in knowledge. Thank you, everyone, please. Uh, Thank you again for coming out tonight. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and discussion that followed. I know I certainly did. Um, we have our upcoming events uh, included in your uh, welcome packages, so feel free to join us for a Pulse of Pizza and Mind or a Cafe Bolletti down the road. Um, you can also, if you're not on our mailing list, join our mailing list at mipr.ca. And uh, thank you again to our guests, and uh, let's give them your small party guests gifts, and uh, maybe they'll stick around if you have any questions. Thank you. Have a great evening.